Hello, my name is Wendy Bevan Mogg and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England. I was born in 1977, the same year of the release of a little sci-fi film called... There's no doubt that Star Wars is, well, everywhere. Like it or not, it's a part of our lives. But while you or I could take another ubiquitous story, say the Christmas story or Jonah and the Whale, as we might be familiar with from school, or even from pictures on the buildings we walk past, we're not free to create our own work centred around the Star Wars universe. As has been clearly documented elsewhere, the Star Wars universe owned by Lucasfilm and their parent company, Disney, is fiercely protected. Its elements are their intellectual property, their copyright. It's mine, you understand? Mine! All mine! Get that in there! Down, down, down! Go, go, go! If I wanted to, I could write and finance a film about the Ark, for example. Where is the Ark? Okay, not that one. Noah's Ark without asking for anyone else's permission, but I don't have the right to do the same with a creative project that includes Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon. They're not going for it, Chewie. Despite the fact that both of these narratives exist within the story world consciousness of the culture that I grew up in, one of these is legally very much out of bounds. Hey! Get out! Next season! Before I continue, it's important to note that the very fact that Star Wars, or any other similar story world, is intellectual property and privately owned is not being questioned here. It's not that I like the Empire, I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. Like them or not, the international copyright laws which protect various aspects of the work in question including right of commercial exploitation and moral rights integrity, exist and will continue to do so. The method and usefulness of current copyright laws has been looked at in detail elsewhere. Instead, what I'm interested in today is not the mechanism of intellectual property law in regard to these story worlds, but more the question of ethical balance, whether or not it's justifiable to keep within the ring fence of copyright a story world which has been distributed by the company that owns it with such ferocity that it is not possible for the general public to escape it. My interest in this topic began with a particular example. When I worked as a development executive at Creative England, the UK public funding agency for film and television, I was approached by the writer-director Rhys Davis, who was applying for development funding for a film called Finding Yoda, a romantic comedy about a group of 40-something friends, okay, not those ones, maybe these ones, 
searching for a pile of Star Wars toys that had been buried after the closure of the Palatoy factory in the north of England in the 1980s. The factory, the burial of the toys, this was all based on a true story. Creative England wanted to fund the development of the project, but before doing so, they wanted confirmation that Lucasfilm would allow us to use the necessary IP. Now, of course, you might question whether Lucasfilm should have been asked simply for permission for licensing the film title name to feature the merchandise, or for a combination of the two. In the event, no one asked anyone anything, and with no permission granted, Finding Yoda quietly dropped off the table. Four years later, however, the BFI expressed an interest in the project. Working as independent filmmakers, the writer, director and I approached Lucasfilm Direct. Now be careful, R2. Good luck. You're gonna need it. Needless to say, our request was not granted. So despite the fact that this film was based on a true story, set in the place where the writer-director had grown up, and could feature toys that the filmmakers had bought as children, we were not permitted to continue. Lucasfilm would not allow us to tell this story. Please note that any unauthorised use of these names, characters, music and images would, as a minimum, be inappropriate. I can't deny that I had flashes of horses' heads in the bed at that point. Nobody wants to annoy a Disney lawyer. Needless to say, after that email, the BFI backed out, and while a documentary has been made about this factory, our film was never developed. Now, I'm not trying to claim that no third-party exploration of story worlds such as Star Wars takes place. Non-authorised fan fiction exists and is tolerated by Lucasfilm, and individual authors have created and published sanctioned materials that build upon the Star Wars world. Artists can and do approach the owning corporations and are granted the licensing agreements necessary to allowing the publication or distribution of the work that they deem appropriate to the brand. As an example, Ian Dosha is the author of William Shakespeare's Star Wars, Verily A New Hope, which was published in 2013 by Quirk Books. This lavishly illustrated book loosely tells the story of Star Wars in iambic pentameter, as if written by William Shakespeare. While the book, which is clearly a tongue-in-cheek love letter to Star Wars, was written by an independent author, the copyright notice in the book makes it clear that the copyright of the book belongs to Lucasfilm Limited, all rights reserved, used under authorisation. The author's website goes on to state that although this work is a play, the author has no right to grant anyone the right to perform it. That also belongs to Lucasfilm Limited. In conversation with the author in May 2022, he explained to me that the deal with Lucasfilm that allowed him to publish the book required him to sign away all of his rights within it. He could write it, but it was no longer his. The gorgeous Darth Vader and Son carries a similar copyright notice. Once again, the author has been allowed to make this piece of work, but is denied any ownership of it. The idea that an individual might use a work of IP that already exists and build upon it has been explored in some depth by scholars including Henry Jenkins and Nico Carpentier. In their paper, Theorising Participatory Intensities, a conversation about participation and politics, they discuss different aspects of participation in media culture and whether true participatory culture can even be fully achieved. But while they touch upon the issue of copyright and note that the struggle toward a more participatory culture is a struggle over infrastructure and norms, they do not, in my opinion, fully engage with the reality that the participation they promote is limited by intellectual property or, in some cases, interpretations of the law which governs IP and, in particular, fair use. There is no discussion of the creation of work that might simply be forbidden 
such as finding Yoda, or, as in Ian Dosha's case, sanctioned, but under a licence that may not allow an artist to make a living. Lewis Hyde's book, Commoners Air, takes a different approach, equating the imposition of copyright with the act of enclosure. The Tower of London was recently the scene of a ceremony which is 400 years old. The chief warder and the chaplain of the tower led the procession when they set off to beat the boundary stones with willow wands. This traditional custom was originally intended to ensure that the youth of a parish were fully aware of the local boundary. I would like to take Hyde's ideas further. I'd like to suggest that we're now entering the era of another, even more extreme enclosure of the cultural commons. Whatever we choose to call it, and it's difficult to put a name to this land grab of our imaginations, this infiltration of our cultural consciousness, it is surely time to engage with this debate. Like me, the author of William Shakespeare's Star Wars was born in the year of the film's release. We are arguably the first generation to have been subject to the distribution of mass media and IP policing on such a massive scale. For us, knowledge of certain privately owned story worlds has been an inescapable part of life rather than a choice. As subsequent generations come of age, for whom international streaming services are also now the norm, we must surely consider the consequences of the saturation of culture by corporations who also protect their product from third-party use. The Disney Corporation controversially made its fortune by taking folk tales, interpreting them and securing them within the bounds of their own IP. I felt a great disturbance in the force as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. I would simply like to ask whether the model of bombard but protect is sustainable. And at what point does a franchise such as Star Wars itself become a folktale that might be appropriated and reworked? Don't everybody thank me at once. Anyway, we should be at all around about 0, 200 hours.